demonstration of our love for you, Lord. We pray that you would use this offering for your glory, and Lord, may you use it to see souls saved here and around the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Can I give praise to Father? Now or wait till next Sunday? Next Sunday. Next Sunday.
Hi. Before I get started, I'd like to thank everybody for their prayers. It helped me so much for what I'm going through. Thank you so much. But you know, God is still real, heaven is still real. You can go through it with me. Give us a reviving. Open your book to Ezra chapter 9. Ezra chapter 9. If I, if I seem to get a little bit nervous, just smile at me. <laughs> Haley's not here tonight. Just pray for charity. She's she's not that sick, but she's sniffling and coughing. And so if I need a smiling face, just smile back. <laughs> Ezra chapter 9. Read the whole chapter, 15 verses, Ezra chapter 9. Now when these things were done, the princes came to me, saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their abominations, even of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Jebusites and the Ammonites and the Moabites and the Egyptians and the Amorites. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers have been chief in this trespass. And when I heard this thing, I rent my garment and my mantle and plucked off the hair off my head and of my, off my, uh, of my beard and sat down a story. They were assembled unto me, every one that trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the transgression of those that had been carried away and I sat a stoned until the evening sacrifice and the evening sacrifice I rose up from my heaviness and having rent my garment and my mantle I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God and I said oh my God I am ashamed and blushed to lift up my face to thee my God for 
Our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespass is grown up onto the heaven. Since the days of our fathers have we been in a great trespass unto this day, and for our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to the captivity, and to a spoil, and to confusion of face as it is this day. And now for a little space, grace hath been shown from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape, and to give us a nail in his holy place, that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. For we were bondmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage, but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us a reviving, to set up the house of our God and to repair the desolations thereof and to give us a, a wall in Judah and in Jerusalem. And now, our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken thy commandment which thou hast commanded by thy servant the prophets, saying, The land unto which ye go to possess it is an unclean land with filthiness of the people of the land with their abomination, which have filled it from one end to another with their uncleanness. Now therefore give not your daughters unto their sons, neither take their daughters unto your sons, nor seek their peace on their wealth forever, that ye may be strong and eat the good of the land, and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. And after all this has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great trespass, seeing that our God has punished us less than our iniquities deserve, and has given us such deliverance as this. Should we again break thy commandments and join in affinity with the people of these abominations, wouldst thou not be angry with us till thou hast consumed us, so that there should be no remnant nor escaping? O Lord God of Israel, thou art righteous, for we remain yet escaped as it is this day. Behold, we are before thee in our trespasses, for we cannot stand before thee but because of this. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for all that you do for us. And God, I thank you for just allowing me the privilege, God, to preach tonight, God. And I thank you for putting on a passionate heart, God. And I pray that you would just empower me, God. I pray you would give me an unction tonight, God, that you would help me as I preach, God, that you would be the only one speaking. God, I pray the Holy Spirit would just be able to take over. And God, I pray that we would know that we met with you, God. I know that so many different things that every one of us are going through and so many different things that we just have to do tomorrow and maybe have to do tonight. And God, I pray that we put all distractions aside, God, and we would meet with you tonight, God. I know just preparing this message, how desperately I need it in my own life. And, and God, I know that all of us here, God, just need it tonight, God. And I thank you for just... Showing it to me, God, but I pray that I would just portray it in a way, God, that's understandable. And God, I pray you help all the hearts here to be open and those maybe even listening. God, that you would do a work in our hearts tonight, God. And I just thank you for loving us. And God, I thank you for dying for us. And I thank you for always being there for us and always hearing us when we pray to you, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So tonight, uh, we're going to go through the book of Ezra. And don't worry, I won't preach the whole book to you. Uh, I left out the one chapter that has all the names in it. But the story of Ezra, it's an amazing story. Uh, it's funny, you never, you don't really hear people preach. I'm going to move this because I do move around a little bit. This, you don't usually hear the story of Ezra preach very often. And it's funny because we had staff devotions this week and Mr. Kim, uh, Daniel Kim got up and he said, all right, open to the book of Ezra. And I was like, there's no way he's about to preach the message, but he did it, so that's great. But the story of Ezra, we'll start in, you don't have to follow along verse by verse, but in chapter one, it kind of gives the introduction. There's a king by the name of King Cyrus, and before uh, King Cyrus made a decree that all the Israelites can go back to Egypt, or not Egypt, to Israel. He said, well, where were they? Well, they started, you know, in Egypt, and then there was a captivity, and, and then the, there was a pharaoh that didn't know Joseph, and then they wandered, and they finally got back to Canaan, they got back to the Promised Land, and then there was the Assyrian Empire in 722 B.C. that took uh, the Israelites captive. So they took them to Assyria, it's kind of the, the Middle Eastern region, if you, uh, Persia and I, Iran, uh, Iraq, that kind of region, took them back there, and then that is kind of where we are in the story of Ezra, that they were in captivity, but then King Cyrus uh, said, you know, he was uh, impacted by God, and God told him, hey, I want you to let these Israelites go back. And he said, all right. So he talked to Ezra, came before him. He said, you're going to be able to go back and build the temple. We know the story of Nehemiah, 
lines up with the story of Ezra, and Nehemiah went back and built the walls. Maybe you've heard that story before, and there's a man by the name of Zerubbabel, and he went back, and he helped with organizing the priest and the law and the, the tribe of Levi. So there's, those are the three men, really, that led this uh, you know, journey back to Israel, back to Jerusalem, to rebuild the temple. The temple was destroyed, and they were taken captive. So they were gathered, the remnant of Israel, and then in chapter one, again, you don't have to follow along in verse four, it says, and whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let the men of this place help him with silver and with gold. So they pretty much said that you don't have to go. They told the, the king of Assyria, said you are allowed to go, but you don't have to. And some of the Israelites actually stayed in the land of Assyria. They were, you know, they were wealthy. They've lived there a while. And, you know, they, cho they chose to say, I believe the number is about 42,000 Israelites that went back. And this is, remember, the nation of Israel, the children of Israel, there's around 2 million, probably way more now. So only 42,000 of them wanted to go back and follow Ezra to do this work. There was opposition. So he started building. The king said, you can go ahead and build. <laughs> so they went ahead and started building. And then in verse 11 of chapter 3, and they gave thanks because God was doing a great work. It says, and they sang together by course and praising and giving thanks unto the Lord because he is good. And the foundation was laid. Man, they got started and the work was going. They were having, you know, there was a wonderful time. They were praising God and you know, everything was going well. Then in chapter 4, in verse 5, it said, and he hired counselors, someone going against God, against them to frustrate their purpose. So he said, man, you know, whenever you do something for God, again, this isn't the message, but kind of laying the groundwork for tonight is when Ezra went out and he decided, hey, I'm going to do something that God wants me to do. He's calling me to go and rebuild the temple. There are people who are actually hiring counselors to frustrate their purpose. And there will always be opposition when you want to do something for God. And they, were, they, were, they even wrote a letter following along the story. They wrote a letter to the king and they said, hey, you know, once they set up their temple, and once they build their walls and once they, you know, they set up their new city, they're going to stop paying taxes to you. And the king was like, whoa, I don't want that. Hold on. And then he, he put a cease to the work. And in verse, uh, and then in verse eight on chapter five, the people wrote the letter and they said, and this work goeth fast on. They said, man, they are going after it. They are building quickly. I mean, the foundations are already done and they're praising the Lord and they're doing all these things. And then they wrote to the king and the king said, no, let's put a stop to that. So then the king put a stop to it. And then uh, I, I, Ezra waited for the king to let him build again. And I thought of that as a time when you have to wait on the Lord. I mean, Ezra decided, hey, I'm going to build. I'm going to set out. I'm going to do what God told me to do. And then he finally gets there, he lays the foundation, and then everything stops. The king said, hey, I changed my mind. Uh, I believe it was, you know, another king came up and said, hey, you're not building anymore. You know, I, you're not going to pay taxes when you do it, so you, I'm going to stop the work. So the work ceased. So I don't know, maybe you're in a point in your life when you want something to happen, or you're waiting for something to happen, or you're praying for God to answer something, and it feels like everything just kind of stopped. Well... I'm here to tell you that in the story of Ezra, Ezra believed, and we'll see in the end, that you know God was still there, God was still working, and just because you're waiting on the Lord doesn't mean the Lord's not there. The Lord was there to help him, and he trusted and had faith, and we know as, as the story goes on that you know the, a new king came, and he, the, they said, go back, and they wrote to the king, they said, hey, King Cyrus said we can build it. King Cyrus said that we can build this temple. They said, go back and check your records. He said, go back and find the scroll. And then I think it was King Darius went. He opened up the records. He's like, oh, you're right. It says right there, you're allowed to build your temple. So not only did he say, you can start building again, but he sent them food and he sent them cattle for their sacrifices and lambs. And he sent, you know, supplies for building. So it was, a, it was an amazing thing that God, you know, strengthened him again. And if you see in verse uh, 28 of chapter 7, and I was strengthened by the hand of the Lord my God was upon me. So Ezra was ready to start building again. God was, you know, working and doing a great work there. And they started building. They actually finished the temple. So then we get to chapter 9, where we're going to uh, settle for the message tonight. In chapter 9, oh, sorry, look back in chapter 8. And in chapter 8, verse 22, it says, For I am ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and of horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way. There was, you know, there was enemy opposition against them because we had spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him. But his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. So we fasted and besought God for this, and he was entreated 
of us. And I just wanted to read that verse to show you that, hey, they are fasting and praying. I mean, they are calling out to God. They're seeking after God. And they are, you know, working. They're praising God. They're doing a great thing. And then it all changes. We get to chapter 9. That's where we're going to focus for tonight. And something changes. That, you know, we get to where we read where Ezra is praying and praying for revival. And why does that happen? Well, if you read in chapter 9, we'll look at uh, start here for the message. It says, Now when these things were done, the princess came to me saying, in chapter 9, verse 1, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the land. So I don't know if you caught that, but uh, there is a backslidden condition. And number one here is because there is a lack of separation. So they have not separated themselves from the people of the land. And we see here in, in the book of Ezra that, you know, maybe you don't have the same kind of thing that we have, that they had. Is they were marrying other nations. They, you know, God said, I want you to marry the nations of Israel. I want you to be, you know, marry God's people. And they were marrying other nations. And we know what goes along with that is they started worshiping other gods. And God, you know, was against that. But there was a lack of separation. So I thought to myself if you, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 where the Bible says, be ye separate. And tonight we're talking about giving us a revival. So what happens? How do we get to a point where we need revival? And I would, you know, if I were to say, raise your hand, if you need revival, hopefully we would raise our hand. Or you may even say, hey, well, this nation needs revival in our world. You're talking about missions this month. Our world needs revival. That's the truth. And that's the fact that we need more God. and We need revival. But how many times do we look at our own life and say, I need revival? I remember, uh, I remember, I don't remember how old I was, but I remember Pastor Nick preaching a message, and I just, I don't remember what it was, I don't remember anything but this one point, and he pretty much said, draw a circle around yourself and tell God to revive everything in this circle, and that's where revival starts. Because, you know, God wanted to use one man. We, talk, we see here that Ezra, there's a point in Nehemiah's life where he was the only one building. He was the only one doing anything for God. And God used him to reach a lot of people. And it started with one person seeking God for revival. And, and, and you know, it does help that a lot of people get on board. And corporate revival, you know, you think of revivals and you think of churches that have these long meetings. And, you know, that's great. Or they go on for days. And it's just praising and worshiping God and the whole town started coming and people would get saved and you know I think of the Billy Sunday and, the, and he would you know bars would shut down and all those things and those are great and that is revival but when I say revival tonight I'm talking about you having revival in your life because then you know we get busy and you know we get you know doing things or you know we get into a, a rut of Christianity where it's like all right I just got to do this because I I know I should but do you have a life that is revived and Ezra, man, he was praying for it. He said, give us the reviving. But, you know, he started with himself first because there was a lack of separation. You know, how much do you look like the world? You know, I thought about that. So a lot of people will say, well, the church is just, you know, a little bit behind the world. And then the world moves a little bit worse. And then the church is just right behind it. But it's just a little bit, you know, it's just a little bit farther back. You know, that's not really how it's supposed to be. You don't have to be just a little bit behind the world. The Bible says, love not the world. And when we talk about the world, what does it mean? It means the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. I mean, things that are worldly. I mean, and let's not lie to ourselves. I shouldn't lie to myself. We know what's worldly. And I, yes, it's more open. It's more accessible. But it doesn't mean it's okay. If something is worldly, we ought to stay away from it. If something is you know, worldly, we ought to not watch it or not listen to it or not you know, hear it at work. Or somebody's talking about, hey, I'm not part of this conversation. This is worldly. You know, just because we have phones and TVs and, you know, we don't have the worldly things that, you know, maybe they had different things, you know, they were intermarrying. Hey, the principle is the same. Be separate from the world. You know, in, uh, this church and we, you know, we don't have different things to look worldly and act worldly to attract people. Why? Because the church is separate from the world. And it ought to be like that. And you ought to be separate from the world. You ought to be someone who says, hey, I look different. I act different. I think of, uh, today it's talking about you know, a lukewarm Christian. You have to soul win. And I read something. I was uh, looking up that quote and looking up different quotes. And it said something about how you know a Christian who is on fire for God ought to look so different from the world that he, you know, that it looks weird. You know, we call ourselves a peculiar people. We know that word means reserved and different. But yes, you ought to be different from the world. 
Yes, you ought to be someone, hey, I'm walking out, and I got my suit on, and I got my, my Bible, and I'm walking out every Sunday, every Wednesday, and I'm going to church because I'm different from the world. Yeah. Or I'm going to tell you about Jesus. Or I'm thinking, when I drive around and I look at, and I like the people watch or stare at people. I'm a very nosy person, <laughs> if you've ever realized that. I mean, people I don't even know. I'm like, oh, who are they texting? I mean, I'm just a very nosy person. I'm always eavesdropping. But I'll watch people, and they're... They're just like, they're sad, and they're disheartened, yeah. and I won't say it, but somebody in this church, I, they didn't know I was watching them, but they were driving their car, and man, they were just worshiping God in their car, oh, and they yeah. were just, I mean, they were, you could tell, they were singing praises, and they were, they were just joyful, and that ought to be how we are. Man, we are different from the world, Amen. and that ought to be a thing. If there's something in your life that's worldly, it ought to be out of your life if you want revival. How worldly are you? You have the same standards that you used to have. I know this world is getting worse, and we've talked about following the world, but we ought to not just improve or, or decrease our standards because the world is getting worse. Right. You know, what you used to do or what you used to not watch ought to be the same thing you still don't do and you still don't watch or you still don't go. Why? Because we are separate hey. from the world. You know, the world will notice that, and that is a good thing. If the world yeah. notices you, say, hey, that person is different. Why? Because we have Jesus, and we have something that we Amen. need to tell you about. So don't love the world. There's a lack of separation. There's a lack of confession. You know, sin is a terrible thing. You say, I, I know that. I'm in church. It's Sunday night, and I understand sin is a terrible thing. But then why are there things in our life that we don't confess? You know, do we just not view sin as we used to view it? There's a lack of confession. We see Ezra was confessing sins. He said, our sins, our this, our that. He was confessing on behalf of the people, and I believe because those people weren't confessing. They had no interest in getting right with God. You know, don't ever get to a point in your life where you're done confessing, man, I've, just, I've sinned so many times that God doesn't want to hear it anymore. God always wants to hear you confess. God always wants to you know, hear you, you know, wanting to get right with him. The Bible says, you know, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So never lack confession. Bible, I'm sorry, the Bible records one man confessing here, not multiple. Revival comes from confession. Now the Bible says, in, uh, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 59. You probably know the verse, but turn there. We'll read it together. Isaiah chapter 59 in verse 2. As pastor says, keep your fingers wet because there's a lot of verses. Amen. Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 2 says, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. I mean, that ought to be the worst thing in your life is that God is hiding his face from you because there's sin in your life. I mean, it ought to be just so terrible that, man, i got to get rid of all this sin because I would not want for one day for God to hide his face from me. And you may be here, you may be listening and say, hey, I feel like God is distant. I feel like God's not listening. Well, I always tell people or I tell myself that there is probably sin in your life that you haven't confessed. And you may say, hey, I don't even know. I tried confessing all my sins. You know, I went through the ones that I usually do. And, you know, I went through the ones that I struggle with and I confessed them. But I still feel like there's a separation between me and God. And I, I don't remember who told me this, but I heard it in a message once. Is that pray and ask God to show you sins that you're not even aware of. Say, God, hey, I just want to get clean. Maybe you've heard uh, Brother Gibbs preach that message before. I heard it a while ago. I think a uh, prayer advance. And he talked about getting Clean. I mean, just literally sit down or kneel or go to the altar and pray and say, God, I'm going to confess everything I can think of. And I remember in the prayer advance when we were at the, the student prayer advance, there would be uh, CPR prayer, be confession, uh, praise, and request. And we would just go around the room and confess sin. And we would pray, and if you were done, someone else would pray, and then, you know, you, oh, well, I thought of another one, and I'd pray again, and I'd confess it again. Or, you know, someone else said something, it's like, well, I struggle with that too, and you confess, and you ought to do that in your own heart, or with your family, or with your spouse, and just go back and forth and confess sin to get clean before God. Because it ought to be that nothing should ever stop you from getting to God or being with God. If there's that separation between you and God that God is literally, in His Word says, I'm hiding my face from you because you have sin in your life. So sin in your life is going to separate you from God. And we know that if you're not saved, the sin is going to separate you from going to heaven. And there's no sin in heaven. God is holy. But in your Christian life, you still have unconfessed sin that will separate your relationship with God. So get clean.
before God. God doesn't know how not to forgive you. I heard Brother Kenny say that once, that God doesn't know how not to forgive you. He will always forgive you. Every single time he's like, man, I did this terrible sin, God forgives you. Pray and ask God. Confess God. Don't let that stop you from asking God for forgiveness. And believe that God forgave you. I mean, actually believe it. Don't confess it multiple times because that shows you didn't believe God uh, you know, forgave you the first time. Believe God that he forgave you. So confess your sin. Get clean. Sin is never worth it. You know, the Bible says that the pleasures of sin for a season. But sin is never worth it. Whether it's pride, lying, immorality, whatever your sin is tonight, I, I don't, we could list the sins in forever until one that you say, hey, that one's me, or maybe it's all of them, if I'm honest with myself, it's multiple, but get clean tonight. Every day, it ought to be part of your prayer time is to confess your sin to God, because your sin is what blocks you from God. Now, I know you're always, your prayer requests are always heard, and you're not unsaved, you're still saved, and you still have a relationship, and the the Holy Spirit still undwell, indwells you, but sin separates you from God. So there's a, there was a lack of separation. <clears throat> there was a lack of confession. And then third here, there's a lack of God. So why did Ezra here praying God for revival? Because he saw there was no separation. He saw there was no confession. And there was no God. And it's sad that a lot of Christians live their life without God. Say, oh, but I'm saved. I, I, I go to church every once in a while, or I go every time the doors are open, but you still don't have God in your life. You know, God ought to be the first thing you think about when you wake up, and before you go to bed, you ought to be praying and thinking about God throughout the day. Uh, Charles Spurgeon said, I can't go 10 minutes without thinking about God. And that was convicting. I said, man, I go hours and hours without thinking about God. So busy and doing different things. And, you know, you know, going, when I go home and I just want to spend time with my family. And then, you know, it's like 730. And you know, the basketball game's on. It's like, or the Sixers are on. And you have to watch it. It's just like, what about God? You know, yes, I wake up and I read my Bible and I pray. But, you know, God is there throughout the day. You know, do you have God? In your life, I think uh, under here, I didn't put them up there, but you can put a sub point under the lack of God is the fear of God. And if I, if there was one thing that I see being a youth pastor in the young people, or even in just our culture of Christianity, is that there is no more fear of God. That God is not reverenced and hallowed like He used to be. And I think, unfortunately, it's because we're lacking God in our personal lives because we need revival. Because God wants to get a hold of you, and you just think he's just there, and man, he's, he saved me, and that's great. But no, God is holy, and he's far above anything you can imagine, but he still loves you to be in a relationship with you. And that's amazing, and your view of God ought to be something that changes your life. But it also should bring you a place of fear. It should also bring you to the point where you're like, man, I am in awe of God. I think it says in Psalms to stand in awe of God. And if you never had a view of God, if you never really pictured God or thought about God in that way, it'll change your Christian life. It'll change how you pray and read your Bible and, and, and how much God you have in your life is your view of God. We need more God. That's it. We don't need another program or another event to do. We certainly don't need another volleyball tournament. We need more God. Amen. Isn't that right? We need more God. In our life, we need more God in our families, in our churches, and our and, 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 and even in our ministries and everything that we do. God needs to be involved. You know, we talk about yes, and you know, we we don't in this world and the problems in this world. Well, this world needs Christians who have a hold of God, who fear God, who know God, who are confessing sin daily, who are revived and ready to help other people. You need more God in your life. Revival is not about you. It's about God. Amen. And before I even wrote this message, I, you know, I, you know, usually I don't, you know, go to Ezra for a message, but God put this message on my heart a while ago, and I was studying it and reading the book of Ezra multiple times, and that was right at the top. It says, before I even, you know, this wasn't knowing this message, this was previously, it says, revival is not about you, it's about God. And a lot of times we'll make everything about us. Man, I did this great thing, or I, you know, I prayed for this long, or I got up this early, or I did this thing. And nothing is about you, and nothing's about me. It's about God. Everything we should do should be focused on God. Revival is waking up to who lives inside of you. Knowing that the Holy Spirit indwells you. Knowing that the God of the universe, who loves you, gave himself for you, created everything, lives inside of you. I mean, that power that you have access to ought to change 
the way that you live. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Talking about the indwelling Holy Spirit. Talking about the, the power that you have. How much God you need in your life. And in Ephesians chapter 1. In verse 19. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 19 says, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe? You believe in Jesus, that's you, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him on his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this earth, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet. And gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, his fullness of him that filleth all in all. When I read verse 19, man, I get excited. He said, what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us for? I feel like Paul was saying, I don't know how to describe it to you, but this power is so exceedingly great and mighty, and it's given to you. So he's pretty much saying, I don't know what you're going through or what God is called you to do, but you have the power to do it. Say, oh, I don't know if I can help in junior church, or I don't know if I can teach a Sunday school, or your know, pastor says, oh, we need new deacons. I don't know if I can do that. God can give you the power to do what he's called you to do. There are no excuses. The Bible says he's given you all sufficiency in all things so you can do all good works. I paraphrase it a little bit, but he's pretty much saying you have what you need to do what you're supposed to do. And this really impacted me when I was a, a teenager and I gave my life to the Lord when I was 16. And God said, hey, there are no more excuses to not do right. Oh, well, my friends are doing this or I didn't have time or whatever it may be. I've given you all you need. To live right. And I've given you the power to say no to sin. I've given you the, the power to do this ministry. I've given you the, the power to raise this family. I've given you the power to be a godly husband or a godly wife. You say, well, it's too difficult. Nothing is too difficult with God's power. Amen. So live in the light that you have God's power. And you have access to God's power. You know, I think of, I'll give you a fun example. Uh, when we redid those bathrooms and I was doing the floor and could you imagine if I was just in there with one hammer, just chipping away at the tile, and then Brother Derek back there, man, he brought this big old pilty, and it was just, I was having a good time for about 20 minutes, and then it's like, man, this is really tired. But I mean, well, I had more power, if I, you know, maybe if I brought in a big old jackhammer, and I probably would destroy the floor, but you know, I would have had more power. Think about the Christian life, and you're like, man, I gotta do this great big task, and you're just in there with like a little hammer. Like, oh, I don't know what to do, this is so difficult. But God is behind you with all the power in the world, but you don't use it. The access to God's power. You have that access. You have all the power you need to do that task. So rely on God. Rely on His Holy Spirit. And follow His Holy Spirit's leading. And this isn't in there, or it's in my notes a little bit, but you know, revival is following the Holy Spirit. I think a lot of times, you know, we like our schedule. We like, you know, oh, I get up at this time and I do this. And, and that's all great. We ought to have a routine. But allow the Holy Spirit to tell you to do something that may not be in that routine. Or and follow the Holy Spirit. It's like, hey, go to this spot today to get coffee. Or, you know, drive over here and give this person a track. You know, the Holy Spirit will lead you to do what he wants you to do. And I find in my own life... And, you know, talking to different people or trying to help different people. I don't know what to say and I don't have any answers. And I just have the Bible and the Holy Spirit will lead me to help them. You say, I don't know how to witness to my family. The Holy Spirit is going to help you. The Holy Spirit is going to give you the power to do that. So follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. And this may be a little bit of a hard truth, but the Bible says, grieve not the Holy Spirit. I'd go as far as to say, when you say no to the Holy Spirit, that's a sin. Man, you are sinning against God when the Holy Spirit says, hey, do this for that person. You say, no, I'm not going to do that. The Holy Spirit is grieved. And then your flesh is going to be a little bit more powerful in your life if you're grieving the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So you're either walking in the flesh or you're walking in the Spirit. And if you're going to be a revived Christian, if you want revival, you've got to follow the Holy Spirit. So follow the Holy Spirit's power. You have access to that power. And then the lack of God is, do you even want God in your life? You say, man, I'm pretty good. I don't need God. And they say, I'm a Christian. I'm here on a Sunday night. But you can get to a point where you say, I don't really need God anymore. I've got it figured out. You know, if, if, you know I've only been in ministry three years. And there's times when I get up on a Wednesday night and I say, man, this is a pretty good message. And I got it figured out. And God says, you haven't even prayed yet. You're going to ruin it. And the reality is, if I don't have God when I do ministry, if I don't have God when I try to parent or I try to be a husband, it's not going to go well. Realize that you need God. Do you even want God involved 
in your life. Turn with me to Psalm chapter 42. Psalm chapter 42 is one of my favorite psalms. I say that, but I just called like three different ones. That I like. <laughs> it's like top ten. Uh, psalm chapter 42, verse 1. It says, As the heart, or a deer, panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Man, we're going to appear before God one day. You're going to be with God in heaven forever. You even look forward to that. And the Lord's just like, man, i got to get everything I can. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you. When I was a kid, I was like, God, please don't come back. I want to get married. Or when I, even when I was younger, I was like, God, please don't get back. I want to go to camp. Or I want to go on vacation. Or I want it to be Christmas. And then I got married. And I was like, God, please don't come back. I want one child. I just want to have a kid. And then it's like, you know, now it's like, God, please come back. This, you know, this world is crazy. I'm ready to go. I had a wife. I had a baby. I'm good. I'm ready to go. But God you know, is up in heaven ready and waiting for his Christians. He's going to bring us all home one day, and that ought to be what we're looking forward to. It ought not be uh, uh, the Chinese food that I have waiting for me at home, or the basketball game, or, you know, this new event. Man, this is going to be wonderful. Yes, but nothing is compared to heaven. <laughs> nothing compares to being with God forever. And you say, oh, well, I want that. That's great. I love God. But on this earth, do you even spend time with him? Because God can look down. He can see you. You've got to be honest with yourself. And he says, man, that person says they love me. That person says they want me. But they haven't talked to me in a week. They, they only pray before meals. They only pray before they go to bed. They don't actually spend time with me, but they say they love me. They say I want to go to heaven. They say I can't wait. Man, we want to want God involved in our life. Amen. How much God do you each actually want? Look at Psalm chapter 63, a few pages to your right in the Bible there. Psalm chapter 63. You know, think about David and Goliath. Some of the, most of these psalms written by David. And, man, David and Goliath, that's an amazing thing, impossible thing. It really relied on God's power. But have you ever considered David as a shepherd just praising God with these psalms? I mean, he had some relationship with God. Now that when I think about these psalms, I think of, I know some of them are written after and some of them are written before, but he, ought to have, he would have had some relationship with God. The Bible said he was a man after God's own heart. In Psalm 63, verse 1, it says, O God, thou art my God. Is he personal to you? Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see thy power and thy glory as I have seen thee in the sanctuary, because thy loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise thee. Man, you can just feel the emotion in David. He said, I want to be with God. Now I think about gym class and you know have some dramatic ones they're like i'm gonna die i need water and we they ran eight laps and well i'll be honest if i ran eight laps i need water too but they're like i need water please let me take a water break and, and it's great me and miss Nico and miss maya will stand at the corners of the gym class and so they don't cut laps and we're like all right go and then they run and they sneak the water around and we're like nope you got to finish your laps first and then they're finally done and man what are they they all rush to their water bottle that is what David is saying. He's saying, man, that hunger and thirst for God. Or maybe you're like me, and sometimes you have a busy day, and you don't eat till you get home. And man, that meal is good, and you're hungry, and you're thirsty for it. Is that your spiritual life? Like, I haven't read my Bible in a while. i got to get to it. i got to get more of God. I gotta, I gotta, I'm hungry, and I'm thirsty for God. That ought to be your Christian life. You say, well, I'm not there. Tonight's the night to be revived from a backslidden condition of not wanting God. Or maybe you're not even saved. You say, I don't want God because I don't know God. Tonight's the night to get saved. Exactly. So how much God do you want in your life? So there's a lack of God. That's a lot of pages here. A lack, and then a uh, letter D here is a lack of praise. And I found this. If you can't praise God, you need revival. Real revival brings praise and worship to God. We talk about the, the story of Ezra. Man, the foundation was laid and everything's great. Everything's going well. Let's praise God. You know, I didn't see any praising when the king said stop the work. You know, we ought to praise God. And we heard tonight, you know, going through a trial, but I'm still going to get up and praise God. You want to praise God when you're having a bad day or, you know, I mean, put that good Christian music on in the car and say, oh, I'm on my way to work and I'm not very happy about it. Well, Listen to some good songs and be happy in the Lord because one day Amen. you are going to be in heaven. You can spend time with God and you can always praise and worship God. Say, people think I'm crazy. That's all right. Remember, we're different from the world. So praise and worship God. Have you lost your praise? 
I mean, man, I, I hope when you were first saved, I loved God and I'm praising God. Everything's great. I shouted out the songs and it was wonderful. But have you lost your praise? Have you really stopped singing to God? I, I think it's A.W. Tozer said, the most times that Christians lie is when they sing in church. All to thee I surrender. And they say all these different things and man, they're just, they just don't mean it. They just don't worship God like they used to. You need revival. And I think that's a, that's a big one for me. I mean, there's times when I'm thinking, man, everything's going on. Everything's busy. And you're thinking about different things. And you're just singing. And, you know, you're there. And you're just in the moment. And, or you're not in the moment. And you're just kind of going through it. And you're saying, you know, every time we pray, whether it's corporate or whether it's private prayer, it ought to be all out for God. And I'm not saying we ought to be, you know, Pentecostal about it and run around the building. But, you know, it's okay to lift your hand and say, man, God, that was great. Or, you know, my chains are gone and, you know, hallelujah and say amen. And I know that's not, you know, what everybody does. You want to worship God in your heart. And that's just an, an outward thing. But if God puts it on your heart to do that, you want to do it. And I'll just be honest with you. I'll give you a, a transparent story. We did the Harvest Rally October 15th. It was a great time, and God really did a work there. Uh, Pastor Justin preached a great job. And we sang a song, um, you know, thank you for the blood. And, and I won't sing it for you. <laughs> you know, uh, it says, you know, thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. And thank you, Jesus, for saving my life. And you know, it's a different version. You ought to go and listen to it. It's a great song. But and Haley, and my wife came up to me, and Haley's like, man, I just I, I really felt like God wanted me to lift my hand and praise him. Great. And I put her on the spot. And, uh, and, and I was like, well, did you? And she's like, no. I was like, well, don't feel bad because God told me the same thing. And I didn't do it. And, you know, what a testimony it would have been to those teenagers to see their youth pastor raise their hand. But he didn't do it. You know, I try to praise and worship God. But, you know, you ought to have that spirit. Say, hey, whatever God wants me to do, he wants me to raise my hand. I'll raise my hand. Well, if God wants me to say amen, I'll say amen. Or maybe God just wants me to just close my eyes and just think about him and pray. And, you know, don't fall asleep, but say, hey, I'm just in a, a, a spirit of worship to God. You know, if God prompts you to do something, going back to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit says, hey, this is something you ought to do. We need to do it. So praise and worship God. Have you lost your praise? Because I'll, I'll be honest with you, when I'm by myself, man, it gets on. I'm jumping around. I'm praising God. You, you wouldn't think I'm weird if you saw me in the car. But, you know, I'll be working out. Or, uh, we're working out. My wife probably, like, yeah, once a year. <laughs> one, one time I worked out, and you know, in our apartment complex, it's a small little gym, and nobody's in there. And I mean, it's, I mean, it's about to be from here to the piano, yeah, maybe a little bit bigger to the wall. And yeah, it's got a couple of treadmills and some free weights. And I was working out this day, it was three weeks ago, and you know, nobody's in there. And it's like stone. So what do I do? I mean, I put some good Christian music on, and I blasted it, and I just let it play. And it was, I was praising God. I was, I was working out. And, you know, gives you energy because, hey, it's an amazing thing that you can praise God anywhere you go. Amen. And it, and I don't even remember who told me, but it's something that helps me mentally. You know, you struggle mentally with anxiety or, you know, or confusion. Just your thoughts are all over the place. Put on good Christian music. It's just something about praising God that helps your mental state it helps you to, to get connected with God. You know, you can't, you know, pray. You, know, you can't pray while you're working. You, know, you can't read your Bible while you're trying to do something. But you can always have Christian music playing and praising the Lord. It ought to be personal. You don't have personal praise. You're not going to have corporate praise. If you're not praising God in your own time, if you're not, you know, worshiping God, you're not going to come in here and just flip a switch. Oh, now I'll worship God. No, it ought to be a mindset. It's a lifestyle. I think. Warren Worsby wrote a great book about worship. He said it's a lifestyle that, you know, you're always worshiping God. You know, I know, you know, whatever it may be in your own life, you say, hey, well, I worship God this way, I worship God that way. It's just the idea of, hey, worshiping God is giving God the worth that he deserves. Giving God the praise that he deserves. Hey, thanking God for all that he's done for you. Verse, uh, Psalm, go back to Psalm 42 and verse 11. David's going through a tough time. In verse 5, he says, Why uh, sorry, why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted me? He goes, Why are you cast down? Why? Oh, sorry, this isn't David. The chief musician. <laughs> and he said, Hope thou in God. He said, Why are you cast down? We are going through a trial, and I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. And in verse 11, it says the same thing. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God. For I shall yet praise him. I don't know what you're going through, but you ought to be able to say, I'm going to hope in God, and I'm going to still praise him. 
I don't know, you know, what your struggle might be, or what you're, you know, what you're, you know, thinking about, or what your, you know, in something situation in your life. But you ought to be able to say, "I'm going to hope in God, and I'm going to praise Him." So, have you lost your praise? There was a lack of praise, and Ezra said, "Ezra saw that." He said, "Man, we used to praise God. You used to glorify God. You used to sing. You used to shout. You used to do all these things. But now it's gone. We need revival." Then let's get to the good part. Number two, go back to Ezra chapter chapter nine. So Ezra saw all these things that were lacking, and I hope you can look in your own life and say, that's something that's lacking in my life, and I need revival. And I know I've, I've shown some personal stories, and I've, uh, give, going through this message, have experienced some of these, that I need revival. In Ezra chapter 9, he had what I've labeled as revival prayer. You know, I say a lot of quotes, but I don't always put who wrote them, because I write them down, but I don't remember who wrote it. So here's another one. Anonymous. Stop praying for revival. What? That's a terrible quote for your message on revival. It says, and start having revival prayer. You know, it's a point where you stop saying, God, do something. God, do something. You say, hey, I'm going to have revival right now in my heart. Maybe at the end of the message, you want to come forward and have revival on the altar tonight. Maybe you go home with your family. You have revival tonight with your family to stop praying about it and start having it. Now, I know when they say that revival, they talk about, you know, everybody's getting saved. You have these big meetings, and that's great. But I'm more concerned about my relationship with Jesus Christ. And you ought to be concerned with your personal revival. So start having revival prayers. Not hoping to see revival, but having revival. You know, God is still real, and God wants you to grow closer to him. Hey, well, I'm doing pretty good, but you can get closer. Hey, I, I, I did this thing, and you know, I feel like, man, I'm growing in the Lord. That's great. Keep going for God, but have revival in your heart tonight. It always starts with prayer. So letter A here is a humble prayer. It always starts with prayer. You see, uh, Ezra praying here, and he's very humble about it. He says, at the evening sacrifice, I arose, um, in verse 5, I rose up from my heaviness. And having rent my garment and my mantle, and I fell upon my knees. And I spread out my hands unto the Lord, my God. So he's literally laid out before God. You know, there's something about kneeling and praying to God. And if you're able to, and when you have private time with prayer and with prayer with God, I'd encourage you to kneel. I encourage you to, you know, get on your knees. And I know it, sometimes in my office, and you know, I, 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 I'll be honest with you, I'm a little weary about this one, but I'll, I'll flip my chair around and I'll just kneel and I'll use my chair as an altar. I'll use that. That lovely couch that you see in there, I, I'll use that as an altar. Wherever I am, I'll just kneel and I'll pray to God. You know, or I'll be in my living room. And sometimes I'll pray at my house before I come here, or sometimes I pray here. But you know, I'll use my living room. I'll just go to my, my couch and I'll just kneel and I'll pray to God. You know, it is a good thing to kneel and pray to God. It's a humble thing. You know, God, you're God. And I'm just right. a human. I'm just creation. I'm just little old me talking to a great big almighty God. Right. And there's, I don't know if you know the name, but Brother Tom Williams is... He's an older preacher. He preached our chapel one time at Vision, and he's, he's known as a great prayer warrior. And he said this quote. He said, if you really know the God that I know, how could you pray any other way? He's talking about praying on your knees. I mean, if you really understand who you're praying to, how could you stand up and, oh, hi, God, you know, how are you doing? I've heard people pray like that. It's just flipping, and, you know, obviously I'm not going to judge anybody, but I think to myself, you know, what is their view of God? You know, how prideful to just say, oh, you know, God, you're blessed to hear me pray to you today, and man, it's just the greatest thing that I'm praying, and think of the Pharisee, man, he's just open about it, and he wants everybody to know, and there's times for, you know, corporate prayer, and there's time for people to see you, but there ought to be a time when you're in your closet, and you're in your prayer closet, and you're in your private place, and you're praying, and you're kneeling, and you're talking to God, and that is the time that you're going to have revival. You know, we think about, oh, revival is a service, or revival is a message, or revival is a one-time thing, and it's great. No, revival is every day humbly praying to God. I mean, just getting to God every day. If I didn't talk to my wife for one day, we wouldn't be very close, and she'd probably be very mad at me. Or, you know, if I didn't you know, talk to one of my friends or for a year or a year or two years, she'd grow distant. Well, how is it that we want to be close to God, but we don't talk to God? Now, every single day we ought to talk to God in a humble prayer. God brought Ezra low so he could lift him up. Not only is there a humble prayer, but there's fervent and effectual prayer. How exciting is your prayer life? I mean, really, if somebody heard you pray, would they get excited about it? Are they, oh, well, that's just some, you know, that's just a mundane prayer. And I know we're not, you know, you pray really early in the morning. You're not super excited yet. But how exciting is it 
is your prayer life. And I won't say a name, but I was in my office one day, and there was uh, somebody was praying in the, in the team room right next to me. I mean, man, it was it was getting on. It was it was an amazing prayer. You could tell that he was getting to God, and when he got done praying, he said, "Man, I just stepped out of the throne room." And that's the reality: is when you're praying to God, you want to boldly approach the throne of God, knowing, "Hey, I get." to go to God. I get to go to the throne of God and Amen. pour out my request to him. And it ought to be an exciting thing. Oh, hey God, bless this food. Thank you for it. You know, give us a good day. And help this you know, relative that's sick. Amen. No, it ought to be, you know, ought to be a, a prayer with fervency, an effectual prayer that gets to God. You know, God's, God is worth it when we pray like that. I remember one time a preacher said, you know, they had a long drive and they said, man, let's just effectually, fervently pray for two hours. And the guy that was in the car was like, oh, okay, well, hopefully he goes first because, uh, you know, that's a, a, a big task to just throw at somebody like that. And, they, and he prayed. He prayed an hour, it went by, two hours and three hours. Why? Because he was excitedly talking to God. And I remember I did that once. I was traveling. It was a seven-hour drive. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to pray to God for as long as I can. And I don't remember how long it was, but it was over an hour. And, man, I was just praying and talking to God, and it was just an <clears throat> effectual, excited Prayer. Now, I know we don't always have time for that, but there ought to be time every day that you make time for God in prayer, that you affectionately, fervently talk to God. It takes time. I'm not saying it doesn't take time, but you ought to make time for God. I mean, we make time for what we want to make time for. And if you follow this team or that team or this, you know, hey, I want to go golfing this weekend or I want to go shopping or whatever it may be, man, you're going to make time for it because you want to. Do you want to pray? Do you want to talk to God? Make time for God. <laughs> I heard a preacher, I think it was Pastor Higgins, said once that prayer is powerful. And, you know, amen, yeah, great, prayer is powerful. But is your prayer powerful? I mean, does your prayer life get stuff done? Or is it just, hey, you know, thank you, Lord, for this. Thank you for that. I'm going to get on with my day. I mean, do you fervently, effectually pray for things? And then you see stuff done for God. I, I've kind of been working on that in my own life recently, and I've just, I've just specifically prayed things for God. I mean, God, I want this done at this time, and I'm not telling anybody about it. And I see it happen. I was like, man, I should do this more often. And I, I pray again, God, I want this many, you know, whatever it may be, or I want this person to come to this event, or I want this person to reach out and, and be receptive to this, or I want this neighbor to come out so I can talk to them. Whatever it may be, man, have a specific prayer request, and God will answer it. And it will encourage you to pray more. How passionate is your prayer? You know, prayer moves the heart of God. So not only is there fervent prayer, but there's bold prayer. Man, Ezra was asking for revival for the whole nation of Israel. He said, man, our king and our princes and our priests, they are in the abominations of these other nations. And he said, man, I am praying to give us just a little bit of reviving in our bondage. How bold are you in your prayer request? You know, if you don't have a lot of prayers or your prayer list is small, you're not asking God, you know, it's almost insulting to him. It's like going to a billionaire and saying, hey, can I have a dollar? I mean, like, what does that mean to me? Here's a hundred dollars. You know, God can do so much for you. Don't ask him for a little. I mean, ask God for a lot. Ask God for anything and everything. He may say no. He may say yes. And I'm not talking about material things. Bob says you have not because you ask not and you have and you ask not because you have a miss that you may consume it on your lust. So don't ask God for fleshly things. Hey, I want a million dollars. Well, no, ask God for, hey, can I... Be a blessing to this person. Hey, increase my faith. Or, hey, increase my prayer life. So ask God for a lot. God promises to answer your prayer request. And I know we know that. And let's not just let that go and not believe it. Because if you don't actually believe it, if you don't truly let it settle into your heart that God hears your prayer request, it'll change how you pray. We know the verse in Jeremiah 33, 3, that call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. There are so many things that God wants to give you that you just have to pray for, that God is always going to answer you. And we won't look to all these verses, but in John there's the four promises in the book of John that say God says, uh, ask whatever, or ask me this thing and I will do it, or ask me this thing and I will do it. And then in 1 John, in 1 John uh, 5.14, well, we'll turn there, because uh, 1 John 5.14 so this is 60 years later, John is writing the same book, and he was showing that the promises that Jesus gave, that he was actually, you know, he was answering them, and it says in 1 John 5, 14, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. 
Man, John lived his whole life and he said that promise that Jesus said about wanting God and praying to God was true and is a promise that he kept. So know that God hears your prayers and letter D is repentant prayer. You know, God wants to hear, we won't spend too much time on this to talk about confession. God wants to hear you repent of your sin. You now sin grieves God. It's not just, oh yes, you know, we know God loves us and God forgives us, but sin grieves God. And letter three here, merciful deliverance. Merciful deliverance. Turn back to Ezra 9, we'll finish up. Ezra chapter 9, a merciful deliverance. So he lacked all those things. Man, they were in a, a backslidden condition. And Ezra boldly prayed to God, and God delivered Ezra. And delivered many of these Israelites here. We'll read about it. Ezra chapter 9 and verse 8. Ezra chapter 9 and verse 8. It says, And now for a little space, grace has been showed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to our escape to give us a nail in his holy place that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. But we were bondmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage. But we have extended mercy on, uh, unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us a revival. And we'll go through these quickly. God wants to revive you. I know a lot of times we'll hear a message and say, man, I'm just so wicked. And I got all these fleshy things. Oh, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing this. Man, I need God. I've been going on without God for a long time. And, you know, people think I'm doing well or I'm doing good. But I know that I need God. God wants to revive you. God is the one person you know, without a doubt, is not going to look down on you. He's not going to say, man, here you are again, confessing that same sin. God is going to lovingly deliver you and revive you. You know, God is merciful. You know, lamentation, his mercies are new every morning. God is going to be merciful with you. You know, read in verse 13 in Ezra chapter 9. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great trespasses, and here it is, seeing that our God has punished us less than our iniquities deserve. And we can all say amen to that man. God has been gracious and merciful to us. You know, you deserve hell. You deserve punishment. Okay? We're wicked sinners. Let's be honest with ourselves. We're not perfect. We deserve punishment. Punishment, But God in his mercy said, I'm going to revive you, I'm going to save you, and I'm going to give you a home in yeah. heaven. So it's available. Letter A is available. God's grace, God's mercy is available to everybody. I can say with confidence on the word of scripture that you can pray tonight, that you can experience revival tonight. It's available to everybody. And then letter B, it's repeatable. You say, man, I've heard messages like this, and I've made a commitment, and I've done all that, and I am back to where I was. Man, I, I just am backslidden, and I was so on fire for God 10 years ago, 5 years ago, but I've just kind of gotten in a rut. You know, God's grace, God's mercy, God's forgiveness is always repeatable. Man, I think of the story of Jonah. It says, I think it's Jonah chapter 3, and the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. Man, that was actually after the first time where Jonah said, God, you want me to go this way? I'm going to take the fastest ship this way. And he ran away from God. And God, what did he do? He gave him another chance. Well, I don't know if you're here tonight. He said, I've been through this. I've tried revival. I've tried getting right with God. And I'm back where I started. God wants to revive you again. Amen. God wants to take you back. Man, that prodigal son said, I'm going to try out the world. I'm going to do whatever the world wants me to do. And what happened? Well, he ruined his life and he went back to the Father. And what was he doing? He was waiting for him. You know, God is waiting for you tonight to get back to him. I don't know if it's a, an attitude or a, 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 a struggle of sin or maybe it's a trial and you've just gone away from God. But God wants you to get back to him. God wants you to be all about him. God wants you to desire him more. It's repeatable. God's grace is repeatable. You're not too far gone. Say, man, I am really in it. I am really far. I haven't done my devotion in a month. God wants to hear from you again. And I mean, I've been in that spot before where I was, you know, backslidden. Man, I haven't heard from God. I haven't talked to God. God always wants to hear from you. You know, say, oh, well, don't base your human relationships. Don't base that and say, oh, well, that's how God's going to act. God acts differently than we do. God always is going to forgive you. And then letter C, it's spreadable. And I know it's interesting that I use that word. I always think of butter. Every time I wrote it down, it's spreadable. I was like, man, that's weird, but... Yeah, it rhymed, so we used it. So spreadable, and we'll end here, Ezra chapter 10. So you can read those verses, Ezra chapter 10. He said, Ezra prayed, and Ezra got right, and he was weeping, and he was sorrowful. And then what did he look up, and he saw what a, a large congregation of people weeping and crying. He said, hey, we need to get right with God, too. 
So I don't know if that's you tonight. Say, hey, I want to be the one to come in at the altar and pray. Or I'm going to take my family, I'm going to, me and my wife, and we're going to pray at the altar. We're going to pray tonight. We're going to get right. That is going to be contagious to other people. That will be contagious to your neighbors, to your, your people at work. They're saying, man, something is different about you. You say, man, I got revival. I got right with God, and I'm going to do what God wants me to do because I have the power that God has, and I have the access to that power. So realize that revival can spread. That I know thinking about missions, and I remember when, when the Lord laid this message on my heart, I was like, man, how do I put mission into that message? And God showed me this point that, hey, how do we reach more people? Well, it's getting ourselves right to the point where right. you're able to be called into mission. And you say, hey, well, maybe you're able to, man, take that faith promise card and just up it a few more, or double it, or triple it. Say, hey, because God has given me the ability to do that. God has made me revive, or I'm right with God to the point where I can do more for him and be more involved in missions. And I, I remember thinking about this message and thinking about missions that so many other people in other countries, you know, I think of Brother Tenorio said, hey, I got this new sanctuary, and, you know, I got this ministry and these people, and, man, he's seeing revival. He's seeing great works happen. And I say, God, I want to see that here. I want to say, hey, well, we had so much, you know, this outreach, or, you know, we filled that map, so we just forgot Tom's River, and we went to Beachwater. We filled Beachwood, so we went to Brick. And we filled Brick, so we went to Laker. I mean, man, we just reached the neighborhood. That would be revival. Or, hey, I just got right with God. Man, I got my sin, you know, I got my sin confessed, and I got my, my prayer life achieved, and I got right with God. That would be a revival to bring us to a point where we are doing what we're supposed to be doing with missions. The hope for this world is a revived Christian. And I'm not talking about a revival meeting. I'm not talking about, man, we're just going to preach revival message for a week. No, I'm talking about you as a Christian being revived, doing what God wants you to do, following the Holy Spirit's lead, getting sin out of your life, is the hope for this world. So here's some closing thoughts. You never thought we'd make it. <laughs> closing thoughts. Number one is make a commitment. Yeah, you know, I mean, a lot of times, and if, if God's speaking to your heart, and I hope he is, I pray that you would write it down tonight. Write it in your Bible. Write it somewhere. Make a commitment. Sign it. Date it. And say, hey, well, I may in 10 years look back and say, man, I remember when I made that commitment, and I'm back where I started. It's okay. God's going to revive you again. But man, hey. making that commitment. Sign it, day, and say, God, I'm, from this point forward, I'm going to be a revived Christian. And then let her be here. Be accountable. Tell your wife, tell your husband, tell your kids, tell your coworkers, that, hey, I, I want to be a revived Christian, but you keep me accountable. And if you see me going off course, man, tell me to get back in line. Or, hey, you see me doing something I shouldn't be doing. It, it may be awkward, it may be confrontational, but hey, tell me I need to do something else. Or hey, I need to turn that off. Or hey, I need to go spend time with God. I need to go read my Bible. I need to witness to that person. Be accountable to someone. And then let her see here. It's just doing. You know, the Nike phrase is just doing. I remember a commercial Nike put out. Not that we endorse Nike or anything they do. But they put this commercial out. And they said, yesterday, you said tomorrow. And, man, that not that our Christian life? Yesterday, man, I'll do it tomorrow. If we're being honest with working out, I say it all the time. Man, I'll work out tomorrow. I don't ever work out. Or I'll go play basketball and I'll, I'll get some exercise. I probably won't do it. But what happens in our own Christian life, well, that's a great message, but I'm tired, and you went 15 minutes over, so I'll do that tomorrow. Okay, you know, that's a great message, and I'm really hungry, so I'll, I'll figure that out next week. No, now is the time to do it. Say, man, I'm going to get revived tonight. I'm going to talk to that person. I'm going to confess that sin. I'm going to revive that prayer life. Now is the time to be revived. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you for all that you do for us. And God, I pray that you pray you'd help us tonight, God, to be revived. God, I pray that you would just work in our hearts and our, our lives. God, I pray desperately, God, for myself, that I wouldn't just preach a message, God, and I wouldn't just, you know, come up here and say what you want me to say, but that I would live the way you want me to live. And God, I pray that you'd help everyone here to experience revival tonight. God, I pray that they would experience revival in their own life and their own homes. And God, I pray that you just work in our lives. God, and I pray that we would just reach out to other people, reach out to other countries, God, and just send uh, support or prayers and just help, God, and just, I pray you do a great work there, God. I pray you help us again tonight, God, just to focus on you, God, that we would put anything else aside, distractions aside, and that we would focus on you and what you have for us. If everybody stand up with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Everybody just stand up and begin to play. If the Lord spoke to your heart, you can come to the altar and pray and talk to God. You can sit where you are and pray, or you can stand and pray, or you can 
grab your wife or your husband and pray and, and talk to God and say, hey, I need revival in my life. If that's you, you can come forward. You can talk to God right where you are. Just take the time right now to talk to God. I surrender all. So bless us tonight, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother, you might want to get out right there for the <laughs> Glad to get you signed up for a pie. Amen. 